This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and it is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. Remember, subscribe, follow, whatever your app lets you do, and definitely leave us a good rating, or if, if you like us, uh, but also write a review. Those reviews really do make a difference. We'll put a link in our show notes to our page on Apple Podcasts. They're still the big ones, so if you would do that, that would really make a difference uh, to help get the word out so more people can participate in the conversation like the one we're having today with Tina Wynn. Tina Wynn is a national correspondent for Puck covering the world of Donald Trump the American and the American right. Previously, Tina was a White House reporter for Politico, a staff reporter for Vanity Fair Hive, and an editor at Mediaite. From Boston to Claremont Mechanic College, from Brooklyn to Washington, wherever Tina resides, she will always have the unique designation of being the first reporter when she was at Politico to have written the phrase Satan worshiping pedophile. So, Tina, thank you with that brilliant designation for joining me today. <laughs> oh, my God, that's like my number. I, I don't care about having written a book. I don't care about my resume. That is literally, I, I swear to God, the thing I am most proud of everywhere I go. Every fancy institution I've ever gone to, I bring a teeny tiny bit of chaos. Oh. And um, <laughs> that's, that's, that what is... I, that, that's all I that's all I aspire to accomplish, really. Well, out of the chaos comes order, but it takes a lot of creativity to get from one place to the other. So I would imagine you bring a lot of the creativity too. So um, we're definitely gonna dive into the book, but I've been reading some of your work on Puck. What strikes me right away is the access to sources on the Republican side of the aisle that you have. I was curious, since the book came out, have you noticed any reticence on the part of staffers on the Hill or other sources? Or that's, is that something you've been dealing with for a while? Um, before going into the book, weirdly enough, like, no, there was always a little bit of hesitance of like, oh, man, I mean, she said she worked at the Daily Caller. She said she had all these things. But like, I don't know, maybe she's hiding something from us. Maybe she's like kind of making things up but the weird thing is is that ever since i have committed my entire backstory my like evil dark secret backstory to paper and go like all right yo this is me this is me being as like honest and straightforward as possible people have kind of trusted in me more right um one of the things i set out to do when i wrote the maga diaries was there's a lot of ways that i could have written this book to make my backstory look like evil and terrifying and like everyone was secretly a nazi but when I put pen to paper, I just wanted to say, look, if you are a MAGA person who is reading this book, I want you to be able to recognize this world. Like, I do not want to depict it incorrectly. I do not want to make it more or less than it actually was. Um, and maybe my journey through that movement and out of it will make a bit more sense if it's something that you recognize as well. And I, can I swear on this show? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I bet you not. The I have been getting like actual Proustian flashback texts from people who have like initially texted me going, oh, I'm going to review your book. It's going to be so bad. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, my God, I remember being 19 at this thing. I made out with my first girlfriend at this at this place you mentioned. And we're like, oh, I wasn't expecting this. But like, OK, I guess this is your Madeline. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you do describe an experience later in the book about a mentor of yours discovering that he actually did harbor some pretty scary ideas. And like there was like this whole code word thing. I forget how they referred to Adolf Hitler, but it was like the our that, friend. Yeah. Yeah. Our friend. And then referring to Trump a certain way and Jews a certain way. And that was horrifying, but it did seem like that was more the exception. I mean, as hard as it was to see your mentor in like a shocking light like that, it did seem like that was more of the exception to the rule, right? Sort of. Um, the thing about the world that I depict in the MAGA Diaries, which is, I guess, the activist right, it, is that it's so interwoven as a community but there are always these elements that are trying to use 
the like structure of the movement to kind of mask or get their ideas into the public sphere. And either they try to find people within those groups who they identify as like fellow travelers, or they just kind of go like, you know, I'm going to get into this position of power. And then this person who I knew back then is going to get over here. And then when I do my crazy thing over here, this person over here is going to have to answer for me. And either they play along with me or they break from me. And that the breaking away part is, I guess, way more consequential. So having to look at my mentor, then turn to other people and say, no, 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 I was never involved in this crap. Like what he's doing over there is his thing. And I disavow it completely doesn't really carry a lot of water when you worked together at the same place for a while or yeah. uh, in my case like he was my mentor that's kind of fucked yeah yeah you know how, how did that how were you able to pro i i had exp i had one particular experience like that with someone that i considered a, a personal mentor for for many years and it was around a big change in my life i grew up very observantly jewish and i became a christian and this one guy named ravi zacharias uh was he was i was reading a lot of his material i was really influenced by him he eventually became uh, a personal mentor after he died it came out that he was like the serial sexual predator and it re like it, it really rocked my world to say the least like this is the man that I respected. This is a man whose work and philosophy I've really used to, I don't know, help clarify what some of my deepest beliefs were. And here he is like, I mean, a, a sexual predator, like, so not just if there's two very different things, but I'm just saying like, mm -hmm. when it comes to the fall of your own personal heroes or mentors, how did, how were you able to process that? What helped was that I was really far away from that world, like both geographically, professionally, politically, by the time that that happened. And that I had left that movement six, seven years beforehand. So it's not like I had always been next to him, associated with him, showed up and talked to him at parties and then went, oh my God, I can't believe you were like that because even if you can, even if you say that like 900 times, people are yeah. going to look at you and go like, how did you not see this? Like, this man is horrible. Like, were you turning a blind eye? It's, I don't know how like my other friends dealt with it, but I actually know I talked to a couple of people who did kind of linger in libertarian conservative circles afterwards. And they were like, I mean, like, I still have to like say out loud, no, I did not know anything about him. And third, like the other thing was that he started doing all of the explicit white nationalist stuff out loud in a like written forum with a group of people started like way after I both knew him and broke from him. So in hindsight and with distance, it was easier for me to think, oh my God, this guy was doing this the entire time. And it also helped at that moment that I was reporting on the movement rather than being a part of it trying to do journalism from like the 30,000 view 30,000 foot view um angle that I had on the movement at that point I could start seeing like okay these are links and these are groups and these are this is like a network and I guess he belonged over here and so it was easier to categorize him as being part of something else yeah 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 that that makes sense you know, you know, the other thing that resonates, I think, not just with me, but I would guess with a lot of people who have to uh, live, <clears throat> excuse me, live and have relationships with people in very different worlds. So in my, in my case, um, a lot of my work is in the entertainment industry. So a lot of my friends from the entertainment industry all kind of lean a certain way politically, socially, but I go to, you know, the, my church friends <laughs> all like lean a very, very different way. Um, and it sometimes I feel like I'm the translator, um, mm. which which I can do. I'm I'm perfectly happy to like. Sometimes it's annoying. It's like when I get the question of like, why do all you Jews? And I'm like, stop, dude. Just I, I don't speak for all <laughs> Jews, but um, you know, and it's usually something political. Why do you all you Jews vote Democrat? And I'm like, just ah, it annoys me. But sometimes have you met neocons? <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. It's like so, like sometimes I'm forced to. I'm either put in a position of having to defend positions that I don't personally hold, or I'm hearing descriptions of my friends from the other circle that 
you don't know these people, do you? You're describing something very different, aren't you? Or worse, and this is something that you described in, in the book that I was curious about, or worse, it, it's like, well, well, since you're going to church, you should tell all those people, blah, blah, blah. And shouldn't you do that? And then I just like, it pisses me off. So um, I was curious, I was too curious how you navigate two very different spaces like that. And like what your reaction is to like the people shooting on you, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> Oh my God, that's such a good phrase for that. <laughs> Stop shooting on me. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, well, it does feel like being shut on. Um, yeah, like, it's not just like you should tell those people, but it's also like, if you believe the thing that I'm trying to tell you, that means like you can tell all of those other people that like they were wrong the entire time and they should open their eyes. Um, at some point during this uh, press process, when I was talking to a progressive, he started asking me about why it was that minorities are starting to shift rightwards uh, into quasi MAGA territory. Right. And I started explaining to him that it was primarily an immigrant thing, a very first generation thing of someone who decided to like junk their past and decide and become an American and embrace it wholeheartedly. And now the idea that the uh, elements of their former life in their former countries are starting to take over America. That literally freaks them out. And then he started yelling at me, like not at me, but almost through me, but in a way that felt like I was supposed to be the linchpin here of why don't they understand that Trump is racist and is the worst thing for them. And I'm like, I can't believe I said this, but I told him straight up, Sir, I believe you're speaking from a position of my, of white liberal privilege. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like I find that a lot of people who want to believe that racial dynamics in America play a certain way do tend to be centrist, liberal, leaning to progressive, and with a really outdated understanding of how minority dynamics work in this country that's particularly born out of class privilege. Yeah. If you are a Chinese immigrant, for instance, who doesn't speak that much English and doesn't have a lot of like Mandarin language news directed at you, who doesn't have the ability to subscribe to something like the New York Times, whose cost of living has started to go up under Biden for reasons that seem kind of inexplicable other than Biden's president, of course, you're going to start being like, hey, wait, no, I don't like Biden, what he represents. Let's go back to Trump. Things were kind of better under him. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Mesa. George runs Mesa Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me. He knows my family. And I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa wealth management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Meza and Meza Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mezawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mezawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. Oh my God, can I tell you about something I saw this weekend? <laughs> I'd love to hear it. <laughs> okay, so I decided to go to Flushing, Queens for the Lunar New Year Parade. Oh. Um, yeah, I thought it was going to be really cute and community-oriented and a lot of, like, Chinese and Korean immigrants coming together to get on these floats about, like, 
our local associations and how awesome it is that Northwell Health and the local Chinese community are partnering up on these flu shot initiatives. Uh, and then I started seeing like all of these Falun Dafa guys like marching through the streets. And uh, for people who are listening, Falun Dafa or like Falun Gong is a uh, quasi Chinese QAnon culty oh. thing. Wow. Uh, yeah. And um, if you've ever seen Shen Yun performance um, advertisements in your local city of yeah. people doing Chinese dances, that's backed by Falun Gong. Oh. Imagine like the Scientology of China. And they also back the Epoch Times, which is the most like pro-Trump, anti-CCP, giant disinfo vectors in the country, but it's also written in Chinese. And so for like 40 minutes, I would say the majority of the parade, it was just like, Falun Gong is good. E subscribe to Epoch Times. Quit the CCP. The CCP is bad. Like I just have, 40 minutes straight of footage of people marching down the streets with like signs against the CCP. And this was like pure immigrant Chinatown in right. Queens, New York. So like the appeal that a Trump message has towards minorities is super strong, yeah. but like, it's just not like crossing over the aisle somehow because I don't know, like there just seems to be this, extremely white, extremely liberal reticence to acknowledge that's a thing that's happening. So you, you describe this in your book. I took note of something that you said, I forget where exactly it was, but I did write down this quote. You said at its core, the conservative movement wants to master and restructure America's civil institutions, the free press, the judicial system, the education system, democratically elected legislatures and elections from the presidency down to the local school boards, and they are very good at it. So what you're describing this this march, it's it, it's almost like it's almost like I, I don't know, it sounds a lot like what you describe the conservative movement to be like, we want to we want to have influence and in, in all areas of culture. And, and in some ways, they're doing it better. Um, because they're just more explicit about sort of the takeover, whether it's school boards or whether it's a march in Flushing, Queens, or am I making too much, much of a stretch to make that comparison? Oh, not really, no. Um, the problem, like, it's not like a giant unified one. There's no, like, secret room where everything is under control by, like, a group of people, even though it kind of looks like it, depending on which billionaire or which um powerful figure is on top at any given moment but it's just a bunch of strategic there's like a network that was laid out and a game plan that was laid out in the 1960s and a whole bunch of people over the decades have like been good at figuring out how to use that network and that strategy for their own ends yeah like i don't think that the ccp epoch times angle particularly existed before covid but once that happened and it became fairly clear that the Chinese government was frankly kind of to blame for a lot of the spread of COVID hot take, but I believe that's true. Um, oh man. Okay. It would, yeah. Um, I don't think, I don't think you'd, and I don't think that's too far fetched though. I think there yeah. are even some folks that were with the NIH and uh, you know, other scientists if you will who are like wait a second maybe we really do need to consider other options i think you know we had francis collins on here uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was like he, that it seemed to be some of his regrets that they hadn't considered that they so a lot of folks seem to be too dismissive of what they saw as conspiracy theories and they're like wait a second we're scientists we have to consider all these possibilities as part of the scientific process right so mm -hmm. anyway all that to say like it might not be that far-fetched. Right. Uh, and also the way that China tried to contain COVID, but just didn't. And in some cases, like facilitated its spread mm. in order to save face is a little sus. And also I just really kind of side-eye a government that 
who looks at the richest man in China, Jack Ma, who's like, hey, maybe the federal banking system should have some reforms. And then all of a sudden he disappears for a couple of months. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. That's, oh yeah, look up Jack Ma. Uh, he was the um, founder of Alibaba, extraordinarily right. wealthy man. All he did was go on a forum and criticize the banking system. Like, it's not free speech. It's not like international trade. It's not China. It's just like, this banking policy is bad, yo. And then boom, he's gone. Wow. He's like freaking gone. Um, but in any case, I am kind of shocked that a lot of like liberally li liberal leaning institutions just did not count, would like discount the idea that there were right link right wing ties to Chinese language apparatuses outside of China and specifically in the U.S. Um, look, a lot of Chi like members of the Chinese diaspora are really suspicious of the Chinese Communist Party. So are a lot of Vietnamese people. So are a lot of um, like way more Chinese immigrants, like not just Chinese, like Asian immigrants whose whose lives were directly impacted by the communist government and whose have like pretty traumatic memories of what communism brought to their countries. For I. Th it is pretty natural that they would gravitate towards an outlet written in their language that started promoting, that started feeding into anti-CCTV conspiracy theories. And it's not unnatural that, and this is true, Steve Bannon is closely tied to the billionaire who backs the Epoch Times and, and, and New Taiwan Daily and all of these pro-Taiwan um, newspapers and groups. Right, right. Wow, we could start pulling on any number of threads um, here that really, to me, aren't that far-fetched conspiracy theories, like um, you, your old boss, who you've had some really beautiful, wonderful things to say about, and your experience with Tucker, I'm speaking of Tucker Carlson, you know, mm -hmm. having like a love fest with Putin, <laughs> a love fest of an interview with Putin a couple of days ago. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I don't know if you're probably to tears of, of speaking of Tucker, but I found that to be what, what I found to be a little fascinating, but not surprising because I, I become uh, friendly with Matt Lewis over the last couple of years is that is your experience with him was lovely. It, he was like such a, um, a fun guy and he went out of his way to help you, you know, not as a way of like, hey, you owe me kind of a thing because at, mm -hmm. at your stage of your career, you, there was never any way for you to be able to repay a favor, but he like went totally out of his way to help you. Um, so you describe a Tucker Carlson. I was actually curious what what you make of at least what we see of Tucker Carlson publicly compared to what your personal experience with him was. It doesn't surprise me at all. And I think when it comes to thinking about Tucker, the cynical path doesn't particularly make sense, even though it's probably the easiest one. I think Tucker is genuinely a very nice and curious person, but he also really has this like vindictive streak that snaps on the moment that someone criticizes him and insults him. And he will kind of go to the ends of the earth in order to torch that person who's wronged him. Oh. And even if it means torching their community, their industry, the town that he like lived in for a long time because they disliked him, it's either like, I love you, I love you, I love you, or I'm going to destroy you. Um, yeah, the degree to which he'll go to nurse a grudge is kind of astonishing to me. And initially, there's an example in the book that I bring up, which is literally the first time I've ever met Tucker Carlson, wherein he learns where I went to high school, immediately remembers the name of my principal and goes, let me tell you about the time he tried to steal my girlfriend in high school. <laughs> and it was as if it were an immediate slight. And I think it's funny because, you know, I'm like 22 and this is a lower stakes period of time. And it's really funny to hear a very important guy say that he hates someone you know. <laughs> but when you take that example and then extrapolate that into like the Tucker Carlson, who you know now, uh, the Tucker Carlson I interviewed in 2022, who just like started ranting about various people he disliked in Washington that like had nothing to do with our conversation. I was just there to ask him about conservative journalism and whether it still existed. Um, and 
there are two things that can be true at once. And I think this is a mindset I've gotten into as I've covered this feed. One, he had a pretty legitimate criticism of journalism these days as being part of a like shrinking audience. It is like a larger amount of money being addressed towards a slowly shrinking audience of elites. Yes, I understand I work for Puck and that's like a really weird balance I have to kind of hold within myself. Um, but ultimately it does have a very awful impact on the rest of civil society. The other thing is true about that is true about Tucker is that he has a personal vendetta against everyone in the elite. Like a personal, a deeply, deeply personal one. Right. So it's a he's addressing he's recognized a very real problem in american politics and society but he has a really really bad animus and reason to hate on it oh wow yeah no, but that it's, it's like not this... so much it's not like philosophical it is like partially philosophical and yeah. also very personally driven you know where my head goes is to something that Dostoevsky said in the late 1800s. He said he was talking about a version of art imitates life. And he said that art imitates life. This is a fact of the arts for centuries, right? But he said, we're getting to a point where life is beginning to imitate the arts. And we certainly see that. We've been uh, observing that. Many writers have been analyzing that. He went on to say, he said, but we're getting, I can see where we're going to get to a point where the arts derive its very meaning of exist, or excuse me, life derives its very meaning of existence from the arts. And why I was reminded of that, first of all, that has, <laughs> that has become our world, right? Mm -hmm. But also the symbiotic relationship between an influential pundit, an influential think thinker, figure like Tucker Carlson, um, he is both reflective of his audience, but also driving his audience at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So, so his his disdain for the elites, as you describe it, that's reflective of a lot of friends of mine who um, ended up finding themselves more supportive of Trump. Um, that that's part of what uh, fuels their continued support, um, and how they, you know, to de varying degrees, some of them are just. I hate the left and that's there to talk about their very meaning of existence um, and mm -hmm. drives all of their voting. But I was curious, um, am I on the right track? Again, I keep on asking. I'm like, I'm, ch I'm heat checking. Like, am I on the right track here? Is it, are they feeding off of each other or is it something that Tucker um, kind of calculated er early on or derived from his first uh, few stints uh, on TV and then built it into his, his success uh, recipe, if you will. Mm. could be a little bit of both honestly like <sighs> there's only so much like psychology like pop psychology i can do on tucker carlson without it getting <laughs> you know facetious or self-serving or like i have the insight that everyone's searching for Ooh. <laughs> sorry you know and that's why i put i kept my tucker carlson's at the very very bottom i almost didn't want to get into the tucker thing but oh, now like, i'm curious <laughs> yeah no no i mean like I guess let's take this from a media theory angle. It would make sense for him to understand the mechanisms of like how people consume information. But I also do think that the disdain that Tucker has for the elites is very much shared by an audience. And then Tucker has deliberately, and this is this is something he actually told me. He's deliberately like shut off his channels of like a media diet from okay i'm gonna read a broad spectrum of things to see what everyone's saying and from where and what the news of the day is to like i will only get my news from people who are texting me things oh and yeah i, I read that it is i put that in the book somewhere um but i don't know like would it be weird for me to compare tucker carlson to oppenheimer Okay, so I still haven't seen the movie yet, but <laughs> yeah, but like you know, the, tease you this the out idea. a little bit yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah, um, but like you get the idea. Robert Oppenheimer goes, "Oh my God, we need to create like, oh my God, what if the Nazis got their hand on nuclear fusion and created a bomb? We should create a bomb first because it's so bad." Oh, and then he just like gets on this path and goes, "Wait a second, oh no, 
this could be hard. This could be way more destructive than just like beating the Nazis. And I don't know whether Tucker has the kind of regret that Oppenheimer had towards his towards like the outcome of the initial idea that he had, but the insight and path that Tucker's gone on has done quite a lot of damage to the ability of American society, American society to have consensus reality mm. and like believe in the same things or be like, all right, here are the same basic set of facts that we're going to work off of. And here is exactly what we got to do for it. Yeah. It's not as destructive as a nuclear bomb, but he was, I think, the most prominent, most intelligent person who drove a wedge in the American discourse. He was, I, I would push back and say that 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 began to happen at least a couple of decades before the emergence of Tucker. Oh, for I, sure, for sure. Yeah, in um, particular, 1987, uh, what was that law that Reagan, Reagan uh, took away where um, it, it allowed for the emergence of Rush Limbaugh and then a, a few years later for the emergence of Fox News? And Oh, it was, it was the one where they were like, all right, um, any sort of political program has to present like both sides fairly. The, the, fair, the fair something doctrine? The, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, okay. So I, I wanted to go back. I want to step back a little bit about your own trajectory. You grew mm -hmm. up in um, Cambridge, Boston area. And it, it was, I, I pictured you almost like by osmosis absorbing American history as it was all around you. And this fascination with the founding fathers and revolutionary war and the found the document, the founding documents. Um, and then going to Claremont, you described, it was cool because you described experiencing other kids who were geeks about that stuff just like you were so um i, I was curious about what's happened uh, like you you were very generous in sharing your own trajectory and i'm sure some of those students that you started out with at claremont mckenna um they got absorbed into the movement but there's probably like a pretty diverse array of where kids first coming into a school like that um, their passion for, you know, the same things that you were passionate about. Um, so it, could, could you, have you kept in touch with a lot of your classmates from, from that time? And what are some oh, of the kinds sure. of different, different um, trajectories that they've all followed? Oh, absolutely. Uh, CMC is kind of real deep. So I, let's see, a real, couple of like actual uh, friends of mine who were in that my like cohort growing up and who do live like fairly public lives now. So I feel fine saying their names. They, they run the gamut. So um, there's a friend of mine, John Clark Levin, who now works on like, who became I, like one of the smartest guys I know. He went to Oxford. He got his PhD in like ethics around AI. He works with Ray Kurzweil now. Um, another one became a federalist society lawyer and now a like law professor in Arizona. Um, a lot of people who ended up at lobbying firms, working in senators' offices for a while, then going off the hill to raise families, a lot of journalists who were not in right-wing media. Some of them, like, did a stint in it, went, oh, no, I can't do this, bailed. Um, and then you had a couple of people who became very well-known um, right-wing agitators. Chuck Johnson, who I mentioned in the book, yeah. became a really nasty troll for quite some time. I'm sure he's still being a nasty troll somewhere on Substack now. And then David Delighton, um, who was, he was a pretty big anti-abortion activist at CMC. And we, I remember pretty distinctly one of the first years he was there, he planted hundreds of little white flags in the lawn to represent um, victims of abortion, as he put it. And then he, pioneered this like he was one of the first people who did that hidden camera inside of a Planned Parenthood technique mm. I believe he got arrested and faces federal charges for it I'm not quite sure where those charges ended up but like he was like, there is a lot of there is a lot of um there were a lot of paths out of Claremont McKenna that could take you into 
really well positioned places like partnership at Deloitte and McKinsey or really dark places like prominent anti-abortion activists who got money from billionaires to convince young women to wear secret cameras into Planned Parenthoods. Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a diverse portfolio of <laughs> trajectories. Um, you know, one, one story that really fascinated me that you describe in the book is your relationship with David and Danielle from, and, um, there's this one moment. It's it's like it's pretty heart wrenching, actually. Uh, David wrote what what was actually true about uh, the conservative and the Republican circles he'd been a part of for most of his uh, adult life. W- what was heart wrenching for me is to see what the Frums had to go through, just by mm-hmm. virtue of as I, I'm I'm probably oversimplifying, but by David writing what he deemed to be true. Um, but it also meant it, it it was also on a deeper level tragic because of what that said about the conservative movement. So I was I, I was wondering how you experienced that. Like does witnessing what David went through give you anxiety about about your own future and what you can write, um, the, the, the price that you'd have to pay, or does it serve to clarify in a way like how you move forward professionally and personally? It was a huge, huge moment for me, just like watching that experience First, it like really solidified my desire to get out of Washington as quickly as possible because it's such a clannish, tribal little town that like if you offend the wrong people or build your circle too closely with one institution or one movement and then you decide to go against it, then like they dump you immediately. I think that happens to a lot of people in DC, but that was bizarre. But like I've seen it happen to other people, but it was so distinctly like it hurt them even more just because they had affiliated themselves with an ideological click and i don't know whether they fully realized it was a click quite yet because when you're in the conservative movement you sort of position yourself as like outsiders rebels we're taking down the elites rah, 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 rah. yeah oh no we hate you you're out um i think that caught them by surprise as well but it really reinforced for me that like, if I were to stay in Washington, I really could not, I had to be more of a free agent. Like I couldn't really be in a position where my stepping outside of the lines meant that the institutional organization or what have you, I was affiliated with would be like, oh no, she did something unacceptable out with her, no more job, whatever. Um, which is why I really like working at Puck, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> we're so new in town, and my boss, John Kelly, and the co-founder, yeah, is based out of New York. And he's always, always, always been more than happy to piss off people in power. Like, I knew him <laughs> back then there. He was overjoyed whenever he had a chance to, like, tell some billionaire to screw off. <laughs> That's always uh, fun, right? <laughs> oh yeah, oh for sure. Uh, he also doesn't really, and he also doesn't have the like built-in fear of losing social status in Washington D.C. because that's a very different town than New York. He's got like, like he lives in New Jersey right now with his family. He's already built a lot of his like social capital in New York and the media circles, kind of in Hollywood. Uh, but in DC, which one does not have a lot of money to begin with and two, everything is based on your reputation. Like I have known people who have been editors dropping their kids off at school. And then someone from a story that like pissed off, like someone who your journalist pissed off in a story who is like the parent of one of your kid's friends runs up to you and starts screaming at you. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, like that sort of social, um, that sort of like influence leaning on is really prevalent in DC. Yeah. And John does not have to worry about that, nor I think would he want to worry about it. I don't think he'd ever really want to move here, honestly. It's interesting. You know, I, I had a couple of experiences like that. My kids went to this Christian school, not many, uh, thank God, mm-hmm. but not many uh, experiences like that. But there was uh, a few, one that comes to mind is, uh, they, it was a classical Christian education model. Yes. Oh my God. 
Yeah. Yes, I, I, I want to write more about that. Oh, geez, that's like oh. a, that's a huge topic that I that is completely underexplored in my industry, but I never really want to dig into it. So this is my kids started. Let's see, Savannah's twenty three. They went to they started going to school there uh, when Savannah was in first grade. So six minus twenty. Yeah, so like fifteen, almost twenty years ago now. About fifteen years ago, uh, and I went to I we brought our kids to the school partly because. I, I wish I kept my kids in, in public school, but my first information meeting, I heard the head of the school, the founder of the school talking about Dorothy, citing from a Dorothy Sayers essay. And I'm like, all right, mm-hmm. I'm sold. I'm there. You know, mm-hmm. and I bought into the trivium, the classical trivium education model. Right. What I quickly came to realize was that that was secondary, if not tertiary, to the primary um, set of uh what I would call conservative priorities. Um, you know, the first newsletter I got started out with, the left is trying to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait, this is from a kid's school? Um, you know, or this, this, this event that I was, uh, I, that you made me think of, we went to, um, a, every month they brought in a speaker for a community night. And there was a lady from e- that grew up in Eastern Europe, was a scholar. And I thought we were gonna learn about what it was like growing up on the other side of the steel curtain. Um, it was one hour of the Marxism, terrorism, Islamism of Barack Hussein Obama. And I got up at the end. I'm like, guys, I, I'm, I, I don't want to get in a debate, but like, what does this have to do with classical Christian education? And man, it was like, it was like I, I was killing babies right in front of them. You know? So, <laughs> Oh, oh my God. Oh, God. it was terrible. It was terrible. And, and they're like to this day, like, it's not like, I have to put up with a ton, but like there are these twins. One was a teacher there and was very active, sent her kids to school there. And I, I, on my walk, I pass them and um, they will never, they won't even look up at me. They won't like, they, like every, it's one of those communities where like or horse trails where people pass each other. We all know each other. Hey, how you doing? You know, it, sometimes it's annoying. Sometimes you just want to walk, but like we know each other. Like, and I see them and I'm like, I see you. You're not saying hello. You're not even looking at me, you know? <laughs> um, sorry, I, that's a little rabbit trail, but okay. Um, you, this is not about me. This is about no, you. No, 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 <laughs> honestly. No, like, I think it's important to like draw those parallels between like things that everyone kind of knows and whatever weird shit happens in Washington. Because like the moment you start realizing that people in power still have a whole bunch of like weird psychological hangups about their neighbors. Yeah. It makes things make more sense. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So one thing I did want to ask you about is some of my entertainment industry friends are very dismissive about the price one has to pay in order to make certain decisions at certain times. Like you said at one point, my position, you you were, uh, there was this guy who I guess was sort of an editor and you were like, what is he? Is he my editor? Who does he work for? And then your story ended up becoming about who does this guy actually work for? And you said my position being the facts are not conforming to your reality and his position being, but they're Democrats. So um, it was one of several moments that you describe where it's like this crossroads, you know, and a lot of a lot of folks would dismissively say, oh, well, you, again, going back to the shooting thing. Oh, well, you should do this. And so but you're like in your mind as a young professional, you're like, I am throwing away my entire career if I do this. That's maybe what you were um, risking. But also, I am now in it. So I, my my name is Mud in all of these other sort the Vanity Fair and the New York Times and the, you know, like it's not like you had, um, I forgot the word that Matt Lewis uses to describe the, the conservative media yeah, ghetto. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's like no, it's a no-win situation for you. How did you, how were you able to build up the resilience to be able to get from one place to another, to another, to where you are now? Ooh. If I had to do that over again in my 30s, it would be infinitely more difficult. Um, I had less to lose in 2012 mm. when I made that decision out. One, I was fresh out of college. I didn't like two, I didn't have student loans or not like intense. I didn't have insane student loans, which in 2012 was like a huge bonus. Mm. One of the reasons I transferred to CMC actually was because they gave me this giant no loan student package and my mother's life had been absolutely destroyed by student loans. So the moment she saw that she was like, look, I don't care about your relationship with your ex-boyfriend. You're staying at Tulane. You're staying at Claremont McKenna. 
like this is going this is best for you and she was ultimately right um yeah and also there wasn't a social media trail for people to pick up on me for just because like I did have I was a really early adopter to Twitter so I went on in like September 2008 but having had experience with a certain like right-wing internet baby troll back at CMC the moment I left the right I was like oh my god he threatened to use my internet pass against me what I'm going to do is like go through all of my old tweets and delete them and get rid of all of my right-wing stuff from back then in order to wipe the site like, clean and move forward yeah. um so if someone really 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 dug deep back into my history back then they probably <clears throat> found it but like it was much easier to launder your resume back then <laughs> yeah uh, at yeah. least your socials um yeah. so by the time I applied for the job at Vanity Fair I didn't have that trail um I had a couple of years under my belt I had this nomination from the James Beard Award which is like a fancy arty um food writing organization um, which is huge, like, it's very attractive to a place like Vanity Fair to have, like, some semblance of high culture yeah. in your resume. And then I also, and I think this is the thing that actually tipped me over, even though no one would ever admit it. One of my old editors at Media ended up becoming the digital director at Details Magazine at Condé Nast. And he put in a good word with his counterpart at Vanity Fair. And I will always remember... Apparently, the guy who did the hiring at VF reached out to him afterwards and said, thank you. Like, thank you for weighing in on Tina's um, application and putting a good word for her. We'll, we'll hustle her along. And I was like, look, like, I'm awesome. I'm talented. That's great. <laughs> but I would have never made it past the Condé Nast, like, internal HR barriers if, one, I had a right-wing background, and two, you hadn't put that word in. Yeah. Like, it's... What was it that um, Miranda Priestly said in Devil Wears Prada? A million girls would kill for this job. Right, right. Yeah. You do talk about that in a couple places where the value of relationships and sometimes, like more often than I've been doing this um, for, for a number of years in the entertainment industry and advising people like, look, if you're submitting to the website, you know, HR at HollywoodReporter.com or whatever, like you're probably not going to get anywhere but if you call a, like if you know somebody that's great even if you don't like just i find that people at the very highest levels uh, of the their respective industries are more accessible and more approachable if you approach them with something engaging you know something less than just transactional like hey hire me but more like yeah you know, hey, I was reading this thing that you did and it was really influential. And I'd love to pick your brain about that. So um, I, I think you did share that revelation that like going through HR at or whatever the, you know, um, the, the, the official way, the HR channels um, isn't mm -hmm. necessarily the best way to, um, to get a job. I, um, you can respond to that if you want, but. Oh, was... no, 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 no. It's a, no, these like, small little social niceties and relationship games is something that not everyone learns and like trust me I had to learn that on the fly because my parents even though they were smart and got into the right colleges just like could not follow up on that momentum because they didn't have those social skills right yeah so developing relationships one thing that I, I was um I I wanted to ask like it's, it's interesting reading this book and, and you must be in this awkward position because I feel like I know you, but you don't know me. So <laughs> one of the first things I wanted to ask you was like, how are you doing? Like, you know, part of it is just like at part of your job, you have to be on social media. And there's more so many studies that are showing an increase in um, like bad mental health uh, mm -hmm. connected to how much we're on social media. So that's part of it. But on top of just like, you've gone through, you've gone through a shit storm <laughs> a few different times. So how are you doing? <laughs> Frankly, I'm doing okay. Um, one of the, I think I'm an, in, I was raised as an internet child. I grew up like primarily on social media, like early, early, early stage social media, MySpace, web forums, shit like that. Yeah. And I also learned very early on before anyone else did, like, what people could do on social media against you 
um, mm. that ex-boyfriend I talk about in the book who turned out to be that giant anti-Semitic troll who was linked with Trump world for a while. He virtually terrorized me growing up and a lot of my friends by being like, I'm going to take this bad thing about you and put it online and destroy your life. Wow. So going through that process very early on kind of informed my, um, informed my behavior online going forward but it's also built up this sort of weird immunity and like best practices for me on like what to do online. So yeah. um, I'm not going to reveal all of my uh, trade secrets because that would give me away, but <laughs> it does involve, it does involve like a lot of layers and a lot of, a lot of like online protective layers, a lot of like, all right, there's this thing I'm not really going to look up right now. If someone, if, there was a legitimate threat to my life or my safety. People can alert me of it. If they're just, if there's someone who's like alleging something horrific and also kind of, if there's someone who's alleging something that could be viewed as credible against me, I would like to know it, but then I will like immediately delegate a lot of the decision-making process to other people in my team, lawyers, PR people, whatever. Right. Um, I do have friends and people who are close to me who have offered to read like my anti-Semitic hate mail if it's important. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it, and I think it's better for them to do it and then let them know and then let me know if it's actually anything bad rather than me to read it and go like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Right, um, but right. They like, hap but they happily do it. So I think having those people in your life who you can sort of like having people in your life that you can delegate the worst parts of social media interaction to um versus like being able to filter things out completely is really useful like ultimately my engagement online really depends on what one wants to get out of it uh which is either all right i'm putting content into the world for your enjoyment i don't really necessarily need to state my opinion out loud out loud online um but and so i will retreat and so i will treat um the inbound with the same sort of formality like is this important to my life do i need to engage with it yeah that makes sense to develop good boundaries um mm -hmm. you know <laughs> I wonder if there's like a Hallmark card. I love you so much. I'm I'm such a good friend to you that I'll read all of your anti, you know, anti-Semitic hate mail. Um, yeah. I don't know. Hallmark's not writing that card anytime soon, but it's nice to have friends like that. <laughs> oh my God. There was this one, there was this one person who um, I started getting this specific barrage of hate mail that was sort of alleging something bad about me. And this person went into like, read it and was like, okay, no, blah, 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 blah. And then he also noticed that the um, person who sent the anti-Semitic hate mail was like all from the same address. And he looked it up and went, oh, the only thing that this guy's associated with is Gab, which is the like white nationalist Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, okay, that guy, yeah, that guy's got limp dick Nazi energy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah. Among so you have certain designations of being the first to write certain phrases on at, at Politico. I have to say that phrase has never been uttered on talk of politics and religion about killing each other. So that you have oh. you now have another designation. We'll we'll make a trophy for you. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. So okay, a few a few questions. So because of your perspective and your sort of uh, academic upbringing your early uh, professional uh, life, you had a certain perspective, like in 2015, like, hey, no, guys, Trump is real. I think we should be taking this seriously. But also, you know, later on, hey, guys, this thing that could happen on January 6th, uh, you know, shit can get real, real quick. So the reason I bring that up is because you brought up the Convention of States. And I'm like, wait, what? How do I not know about this? And how real is this? Should we all be afraid like right now? <laughs> mm. The reason I freaked out, oh, the reason that I kind of considered, yeah. the reason I considered January 6th itself to be a legitimate threat was not that there was one person who said, all right, January 6th is the time we can like protest against the government by maybe invading the Capitol. It, 
it was a whole bunch of disparate groups believing a certain thing and thinking that it was time to convey, like to congregate around the Capitol at a certain time with a shared message in mind of like, this is an illegitimate process. Let's do something about it. For the Proud Boys, um, for the Proud Boys, it was like, we're going to attack anyone who's trying to take this away because that's just not right. And in our like Proud Boy opinion, the militia theory of government as like embodied by the Oath Keepers was we have a right to oppose any form of tyranny using any means necessary, including force. Um, the Trumpist people coming in were like, it's time to stop the steal. This guy's taking it away from our president, who's Donald Trump. The grifter class was like, you know, it's a great place for us to elevate our platform. Let's go on there and amplify everything. The Convention of States theory of it's perfectly constitutional and in line with the founding to rebel against the federal government and if needs be break apart from it has always had a like place in American political thought um, going back to like even before the Civil War, which I guess is like the most ultimate iteration of that. But if there is a groundwork laid in certain states for this thing to happen and a whole bunch of other people who are willing to come on board with this idea from different groups for whatever means and purposes necessary, it could erupt into something. It really could. And it's just a matter of like, what is the tipping point or what is the key event to make that happen? So I'll say this. Every so often, I'll like be at some right wing event and I'll see a booth or a pamphlet stand for the Convention of States. And it will be anything from like a Turning Point USA event to the Faith and Freedom Forum in Iowa, posted by Bob Vander Plaats, to um, a gun show in Minnesota or something. And who knows whether that's going to be the one guy pulling the strings, but it's certainly an idea that's being seeded into the ether. And out of all of the crazy right wing cons, like mine, like landmines that are being placed out there, that's the one that unnerves me the most. It's just a matter of like, is there momentum for that to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, wait, it needs, what, 37 states? Am I right? Thir 30, 37 or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, and now because... there's there's like 18 or so that, that have the the both uh, houses of the legislature and the executive branch. Is that what it requires, both houses of the legislature and, and the executive branch? Just both houses of the legislature, I think. Oh, okay. Yeesh. Yeah. Um, and there's like 18 right now. Um, or. or... Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, the scary thing, too, is that, like, I was talking to David Jolly, uh, who used to be a Republican congressman out of Florida, and yeah. had just a couple of times, and I was like, yo, this, like, we were talking about the Convention of State things, and I was like, wait, why would he do this? And he goes, well, when I was a Republican congressman, my advisors would always tell me, like, look, it's a good idea for you to accept these guys' endorsement. It's a really big signal to the base that you're, like, a super hardcore Tea Party guy. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting to see so many different trajectories. You know, some folks were initially inspired by the early part of the Tea Party movement, but then the Tea Party movement just like was sort of hijacked by any number of other entities, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that, I guess that's, a, that's maybe for the, for the, next, uh, the next conversation. Um, I do have a few more questions for you and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. This is what I call the TPNR question. Uh, talk mm -hmm. politics and religion without killing each other. So what do you think each of us can do to be better able to share space with, have better um, conversations with, even nurture relationships with people across our differences? This is like, this is your world. Like you're in, in very different worlds and you clearly are able to, to maintain uh, relationships with folks across a, a broad array of differences. So it's, it's, it's people who think differently than we do, have different beliefs than we do, get their news from different sources than we do. Basically, how can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other? Or is it even possible? Ooh. So there is a, um... oh God, I'm going to use so many therapy terms in this. Um, 
I need it. I need- <laughs> yeah. Look, I think this all requires therapy. This is not like a. This is not like I'm going into civics class and where I'm going to like pretend to be the founding fathers. This is a mindset, man. Yeah. It is completely possible to hold two different ideas at the same time. It is called the dialectic. Um, it is possible for someone to be a good person and to believe something that is a completely different universe than you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is possible for someone to like be kind and generous and love their family and try to do well by their love by their community, but then also believe that you know it's time for the government to succeed to for like the state of Idaho to succeed from the union and with a gun. Um, but the difference between like being that good person and then taking that outcome is where the challenges lie and I think as long as you go into the conversation with the great allowing them that grace but then also learning where their beliefs lie and what the outcome is that is understanding that is not necessarily like conversion or unification or healing a divide it's just like understanding the depth and way that it's cracked and why they went this way and you went that way my job is literally to exist in that divide and it does make me feel a little bit less in it makes me feel less stressed about things just knowing that there is a reason that this splits existed and I'm not quite sure what knowing that space would mean for people who are actively trying to push things back together because that is not my job nor my inclination. But I've always believed it's better to understand the like gray world. Yeah. Yeah. At the, uh, no, I get it that your job is not necessarily to be like Monica Guzman's job at Braver Angels, but more the hat that she wears as a journalist to accurately reflect v- uh, different um communities if if not different worlds so that that totally makes sense um did you have any questions for me yeah how did you i mean as someone who also exists in the same space but total took a really different path to get there what have you found so far while taping this podcast and like and how to answer that question that we talked about yeah it's i am object like My objective is to, it's not to get people to agree with each other. That's not the point. My objective is simply to allow folks to see each other in a more human way. Um, What what I've found is that if we can own, the first step is admitting it, right? So if we can all own up to our own I'm going to say it, but if anybody's listening, it might trigger uh, some of my friends in particular from church, if we can own up to some of our prejudices, um, Mm -hmm. but it's a different sort of prejudice. Um, You know, the prejudice is all those Democrats, the left, the progressive, the liberal, you know, so that's the prejudice is like, wait a second, you're totally casting everyone outside of your particular circle as one big homogenous group, you know, and the same thing can be said of, you know, some of my progressive friends who all think that all these Christians are a certain way or all of these, you know, other circles that I'm, I'm a part of. So all that to say, I think the, the, the thing that is the antibody against this disease of othering each other, mischaracterizing groups outside of your own, um, demonizing and vilifying people that you think are part of those groups, the antibody against that is relationships. It's re- having real conversations with real people and getting to know them on a more human level. Even if the relationship doesn't happen from there, if you could just see people for, as an individual human being, as opposed to, oh, he's, he's part of the left. You know, therefore, I need to treat him this you know, or her this way. Um, so that's more than anything else. You know, and Monty has, has some good um, tools that she wrote about in her book from last year. I never thought of it that way. And that is like, instead of like, kind of what you've probably experienced, like getting into, well, if they only knew this, well, then they should do that, you know, getting into a fact throwing thing as if it's like this rhetorical grenade that I can toss at you and blow it up. And then you'll have to agree with me. Um, 
instead of doing that, like maybe just being kind of curious about people, like, tell me about your life, man. Like, so you're, you support Trump. I see the bumper sticker on your truck and, you know, but to tell me about your life, you know, there's this great quick story that, and then I'll wrap up, but uh, Monica went to uh, a Northern part of Oregon and a Trump, uh, a, a fellow who supported Trump, he's a farmer. He's like, if there's one thing I wish folks knew about me, they were having a, a meal together. He's like, I wish that folks knew how what's in my field that I work on, you know, 18 hours a day gets to your plate as this sandwich that we're eating together. I wish folks knew that. I wish folks knew like my life in that, that way, you know, and that all of a sudden humanizes that dude and gives it, gives his life's work mm -hmm. a, a sense of meaning that we can all appreciate, you know? Yeah. So, I had this experience with, um, someone who I met in Texas when I was on my road trip, uh, we were talking, he was a rancher and we met in this, um, we were just hanging out in this bar in Marfa of all places. And it was the first time I'd heard someone who was like a diehard Republican focused on the border talk, like with like, not just fear, but with like the expertise of someone who had been doing this for decades, like being a, he was a fourth generation rancher or something. And his language was a little coarse, but he, but he was like, look, when I was growing up, there were always going to be migrants coming across the border. It was perfectly fine. My family would just say like, look, let's just leave, look, let's leave some food on our doorstep just to make sure they don't die on their way to the fields and on their way back home. Um, but like over the decade, like over the past couple of years, even his, ex his talking about how it used to be like a fairly benign kind of like even okay presence to like oh my God, there's just like so many of them coming across the border. It's like completely, like not to like, they like to sort of like echo that really crude way that Trump said it. Like they brought like some pretty horrific things like within the immigrant population that came across the border, there were some really horrific things that never made it past initially. Like houses on like houses and sheds on his property being burned down mm. um cartels suddenly appearing in the border regions and anyone who tried to speak up would get murdered in the american side and then somehow brought over to the mexican side and then their bodies would be displayed like wow. it was it was gruesome and i could tell that this was something that he'd been like so furious that no one else could see other than him yeah and I was like, look, okay, no, you're not just some like guy from far away coming down with a gun. Like you've watched this happen over decades. And it was, and like, this was not something you were always going to hate. This was like a fact of life for you. And then now it's just gotten infinitely worse. Like that's pretty horrible. Yeah. That's interesting. That's an interesting insight uh, because, you know, someone like me, I'll hear Trump's rhetoric uh, and, and a lot of other Republicans are echoing an invasion. And I'm thinking, roll, reel, it, reel it in, dude. Like, what, but if you're speaking to a human being whose family has been on their land for generations and he's mm -hmm. seen the differences and there's something different about it now, um, it's irresponsible of me as his neighbor, albeit from a neighbor from far away, to dismiss it and then to vilify him by saying, oh, well, you're just prejudiced against brown people. Um, mm -hmm. That's not, to say the least, it's not productive. It doesn't get right. us anywhere. But to, then it allows, it allows that individual to be heard as a human being, as an individual. And then it allows us to address a problem. This is a real problem. Mm -hmm. So right. I get it. So before we go, how can folks follow you online, find more information about the Mag Diaries, all your great work that you're doing at Puck? Uh, let us know how we can find you. Sure. Uh, you can buy the Mag Diaries literally at any bookstore from Amazon to your local uh, bookseller. Um, you can subscribe to Puck, where I get very, very deep inside the worlds of the powerful people making MAGA happen at uh, Puck.news. Just subscribe to me and the rest of Best and Brightest. Um, I'm at Twitter slash X at Tina Nguyen, no, Tina underscore Nguyen. I was a very early adopter and I got that handle and I'm very awesome. proud of myself. And my Instagram is the last win, as in there were multiple wins and I'm the last one you should ever want to meet. <laughs> the last win? <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Okay. Um, good. Um, 
Oh, how was it writing the book? You, you like, you're used to writing these columns, 800 word mm-hmm. essays or whatever. How was it writing like a 200 page plus book? Oh my God. It's a totally different mindset. Like I really like, I don't know if I really want to do that anytime soon again, but it's like taking that one thought that you have and then like stretching it out to encompass more. Yeah. (laughs) And that's really hard. Um, One day I'll come up with an actual guideline to writing a book. If you grew up in the internet age and don't know how to make your thoughts last for (laughs) 7,000 words. That's, that's all I'll say about it right now. All I want to do is sleep, man. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Well, this has been a ton of fun, Tina. I really enjoyed, I, I so enjoyed the book. I enjoy your writing on Puck. Uh, and I, I've especially enjoyed getting to know you now. Actually, not through your book, but like the real person. So this, is, uh, this has been awesome. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. And as always, if you dig what we're doing, please follow, rate, and review, especially the review thing, like I was saying before. Write a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does make a difference. And tell a friend about what we're doing here. Tell a friend about Talk of Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. We are easy to recommend. It's politicsandreligion.us. It's www.politicsandreligion.us, where you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. It's Corey with an E. S is a Sam at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week.